Okay, we'll start, let's start with the meeting. Um, Maya, would you mind sharing the screen for us? The presentation? Thank you. We have a full agenda today. So I'll start just by giving the general overview. So as you know, this is a Zoom meeting. Can I go to the next one? Yes. So just now that you're here, uh, just remember that you can always join from your browser. Um, can I go to the next? And uh, you can also do the one tap calling number in case you miss your connection. And remember to unmute yourself only when you're gonna talk and turn on your camera if you feel comfortable doing it. At least that way we get to see our faces. And uh, use the chat feature to write your comments or you can also raise your hand and unmute to participate. Next one. So just as a reminder, uh, this coalition focuses on helping uh, improve the transportation equity system in Boulder County. We focus on providing opportunities and um, in, in transportation that eventually will help people improve their quality of life and basic needs so that they're all more mobile and more thriving societies um, with better transportation options that center equity. Next one. We have a very packed agenda today. So this is the first part of the agenda. We are doing the welcoming and the, uh, the icebreaker with the introductions. Then we have a couple of updates from the Mobility for All team. Um, and then we have updates from partners. So Rebecca is gonna tell us a little bit about her program and then Carla is gonna talk about Let's Go too. Next one. Then we have two presentations or first, block of presentations will be on the Colorado 119 update, then the North Foothills Bikeway, and then the BERT project um, that Tanya is working on. And then we have the United Way 211 call center, that's with Kim, and then we have the conclusion. So let's start. To begin with the MAC updates, I'll give you the first one. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, some of you are aware, and if you are not, I'll give you an overview. <clears throat> we have a um, driver recognition campaign that um, we started at the beginning of the year. And right now we have uh, six different drivers and six riders that we will be interviewing next week to create a marketing campaign. The riders, um, no, the drivers, we um, selected them through the survey that we did last year. So we have writers from RTD, Cultivate, Zitrip, BBSD, and VIA Mobility Services. So I'm very excited about doing this campaign and promoting the, uh, the profession. I don't know if anybody has any questions about this campaign. not, we can move on to... Hey, Jessica, I have a question. Yeah. Um, could we share with the with the group, like, um, maybe, like, what social media outlets we're going to be sharing this on, and, like, what's the overall goal coming out yeah. of this? So, yeah, thanks. So, the social media outlets are going to be on Facebook, um, as reels on Instagram. And for the most part, we're going to be short videos, uh, very quick videos, because nobody has a long attention span nowadays. So it'll be short clips uh, featuring drivers and riders. And um, yeah, the goal is to promote the profession, but also bring people into um, or direct people to our landing page where they can find opportunities to work in some of those um, transit agencies that we have there, or also volunteer too. So there's both volunteer drivers and paid drivers that will be uh, featured in this project. Yeah, thank you. If there's no other questions, we can move on to the next update. Um, Esther was asking uh, oh. when the start for the campaign. Okay. Uh, yeah. So good question. We 
are thinking or hoping that the recording and the post-production part of the campaign is over um, by June, July. So I think we hope to um, get it done by the summer. But we will be sharing all of that with you, with all of you. Yeah, thank you. Do you wanna go to the next slide, um, Maya? Thank you. So now Sarah is gonna tell us about her mobility uh, workshops that she's leading at the Center for People with Disabilities. Are you around, Sarah? No. Yes, I'm trying to unmute. Yay. Hi, friends. Um, yes, as Jessica has said, I am teaching a workshop series at the Center for People with Disabilities in Longmont. And um, it is going very smoothly. Last week, last Thursday, we had the second one out of seven. So the second one was about transit app. And then the one coming up in June on the 27th is about... Um, Oh my goodness, my brain is blank. It's red and it, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> RTD My Ride app. Um, I could see it in my head and I couldn't get it into my mouth. So thank you, Jessica. Um, but yes, yes, it's about RTD. And then um, there'll be one about Uber and one about Lyft. And then there's going to be one about Accessoride in September. And then in October, there's going to be one about Access On Demand. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put the registration link in the chat and I'm I'm copying it. So that might be a, a couple of seconds here, but yeah, no worries, Sarah. It's awesome. Um, Thank you. Someone who doesn't speak English wants to come to your workshops. Can they come? Yes. Yes, and they should. They should come. Um everyone is welcome. And if they don't speak English and they don't feel comfortable speaking English or listening to English as their first language, they should request a translation um, by calling us at Mobility for All at 720-564-2218, just our regular standard number, and request a translator, and that needs to be 72 hours or more before the event starts. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, yeah. we provide interpretation services. So um, yes. just let us know in advance and we can work with, with you. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Let's move on. And yes, thanks, Adriana. We also have Mobility for All ambassadors that can help us um, if we have uh, people that, wanna, that want our help in Spanish. Thanks, Adriana. Yes. Um, Melissa, you have another update for us. Um, yeah, I, I would like to share with the group. I think I've shared a couple times already about the mobility options flyers. I've definitely um, shared them with a couple of folks that came to our in-person Mac meeting. I think that was last month. Um, just to people to see what the, what the inclusive plan process of like an easy to digest um, accessible flyer slash poster for all of the mobility options that are kind of in our area. Um, so the they're finally done. And um, I, I slash Angel reached out to the group to see who would be interested in um, taking part in us and printing posters um, for those who attend the MAC meetings. Um, the posters, 18 by 24 inches, so they're pretty big, um, but ideally, like, one or two of those could be put up in, I don't know, bulletin boards or um, more where people can gather, where they could be a good place to just peruse your options, you get a picture of it, or scan of the lovely QR codes that there are. Um, and then the flyers are going to be more for um, outreach events and something that will print out and give to people to keep with them. So, um, yeah, that's really all I update wise. If there's any questions, let me know. Any questions for Melissa? 
I see that um, Sarah is sending the information about her workshops in the chat. And um, Melissa, I know you sent a survey to ask if any partners wanted flyers. Uh, yeah. Is it too late to request more flyers? Um, I, have, flyers? I have not put in there yet. So um, if, you, if you'd like some from your organization, just shoot me an email at mobility for all. Um, boulderkennedy.gov and I can put you on the list. Um, and then I see that as asking about branding and logos on these. And if anyone wants access to these PDFs, I can send them and you can edit them, update them or whatever, as you see fit, you could have, have the flyer print yourself um, or whatever. Yeah, we're happy to share that with you guys. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And we'll add our um, email um, to the chat too. Um, yeah. Moving on. Would you want to move to the next slide, please, Maya? Thank you. Uh, now, Joseph is going to tell us a little quick recap about our Cinco de Mayo event. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, Mobility for All had a booth at the Cinco de Mayo Festival at Longmont, and it was a big success. We engaged with 451 people, which is about more or less 40 more than the previous year. Um, and this was from like families, adults, children. I personally managed the uh, prize wheel, which was uh, a lot of fun kind of <laughs> hearing a lot of the responses from kids, um, you know, ranging from like, you know, how would one get to school or, um, you know, how far apart should a car be from a bike, um, questions like that, um, all transportation related um, prizes. Uh, were crossbody bags, Loteria bags, um, candy. Um, and it was just kind of a fun day with like uh, great people, great music, great food. Um, and yeah. Yeah, it was a very good event. This is our biggest event of the year. And I thought it was a great success. And um, Jen too was one of our ambassadors who was in the corner right side of the um, of the this slide. Yeah, thank you, Maya. <laughs> um, also, thank you, Joseph. Let's move to the next update. I believe that was her last internal update. Um, yeah, so now we have updates from the MAG stakeholders. And Rebecca, you're up next. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about your vocal IDD mill levy update? Great. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Seiden. I am the IDD Mill Levy Program Coordinator. Um, the IDD Mill Levy was passed in 2002 in Boulder County, and it provides funding to increase services for people who reside in Boulder County who have an intellectual and developmental disability, autism, and or brain injury. Uh, we had a needs assessment in, that was presented to the county in 2019 which outlined some very um, high priority needs for the county. Those needs uh, include housing, systems navigation, case management, and advocacy, mental health, self-advocacy, community engagement, and social connectedness, community education and IDD awareness, and ongoing monitoring and evaluation. We have an IDD advisory council that meets monthly that makes recommendations through the housing division and up to the board of county commissioners um, for recommendations for future investments from this mill levy. Imagine an ACMI, IDD means, I'm kind of using the abbreviations now. So IDD means intellectual and developmental disabilities. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. Thank, Thank you for you. asking. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, of course. Some, of course. That's all right, Sarah. And sometimes <laughs> I will say BI instead of brain injury just to make things a little bit more quick. So, um, so Imagine has been the single entry point for years now for the DD waivers, the developmentally delayed waivers. Um, ACMI, Adult Care Management Inc., has been the single entry point for the other waivers, such as the brain injury, mental health, the emotional, um, sorry, elderly, blind, and disabled waiver, et cetera. Those two agencies are joining together 
to become A and I avenues. Um, this is from a federal mandate. Um, and so there will only be a true single entry point now um, for Medicaid waivers in Boulder County that will be A and I avenues. As of July 1st, they will be combined. So imagine is not going to be the case management agency anymore. They will be using the Imagine name for their direct services or their pre-approved service agency side of the agency. So we have been working with the case management contract, the A&I contract, in order to get that running by July 1st, 2024, to get it executed and in place. Um, we did recently put out two RFPs, referrals for proposals, um, for funding. One of the RFPs was to increase social and re recreational activities for people who live and reside in Boulder County with IDD, BI, and autism. And the other was to increase direct services to the same population for people living in Boulder County. Um, those awards will be made public pretty soon now. Uh, we, the IDD Advisory Council, as I said, um, works monthly and we work on different initiatives from the um, needs assessment. The, uh, we do now, we no longer are taking applications for funding. Um, at this time, I'm unsure when we will putting, be putting out some RFPs. I do anticipate um, that we will be putting some out in the future though. That was to answer our question, thank you. Um, the IDD Advisory Council is currently working on developing a public engagement plan. And we're very interested in working on community education as part of that plan this year. So recently, Imagine presented a training um, of their um, eligibility and their waiver system to Family and Children's Services and also the Projects, Contracts, and Services Division for um, Housing and Human Services. We are working on bringing brain injury training into the division as well, and also to include community partners. If you would be also interested in attending a brain injury uh, workshop, then please let me know, and I would be glad to add your organization to that list. Um, other planned trainings that we plan on bringing in is Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. Um, that is a state agency that works on employment for people with disabilities. Uh, Medicaid waiver training. We want to also bring in education of disability rights for parents and individuals. And then any other pertinent training that we feel will add to the community education and knowledge. We're revamping our website right now. We want to include some training uh, videos and updating resources because uh, we do want to make it a, a resource depository for um, people with IDD, BI, and autism in Boulder County. So there's a one place that they can go and, and find resources. Yeah. We did develop and we have a systems navigator for Boulder County. I do believe it is the only systems navigation position like this in the state. It is specifically for people with IDD, BI, and autism. And this person helps them navigate the different systems that they need to get in in order to get support services, such as long-term Medicaid, Social Security, any of the Medicaid waivers that they need to apply for to get supports to live as independently as possible in the community. She has really made great inroads. She's assisted many youth and families in identifying disabilities early and getting youth into systems earlier to make an impact on their supports for the rest of their life. We have provided um, a mental health dual diagnosis training. Uh, CCHA, which is our Ray, um, gave us a grant and we had, we Oliver Behavioral developed a training on how to work with persons with IDD, BI and autism as a mental health provider. This in hopes will bring more opportunity for people to work with that population within Boulder County as there's a real need and an absence of providers right now. 
Um, we're very excited because uh, we had 40 spots for the first training and we were able to fill 39. We will be having another training in the fall. If you're on here and you are a mental health provider and wish to be on our list for that and are eligible to take Medicaid, also please contact me and I'll be glad to put you on the list. <clears throat> We're looking, we're continuing to look at providing an IDD mill levy housing navigator and an IDD mill levy residential housing specialist to Boulder County to work specifically with this population on housing needs. And um, we're, <coughs> excuse me, we are working collaboratively with the city of Broomfield, Inclusive Housing Coalition and the Denver Mill Levy. We are going to be presenting a regional IDD housing seminar in the fall with breakout sessions to bring um, the need for IDD housing to the state level. It's a very severe need. We have very few units in Boulder County um, that are affordable and accessible and specifically um, set aside for this population. We have also begun work um, in looking at providing units at Willoughby Corners phase two and I am talking with BCHA right now about that possibility. We, um, the biggest change recently has been that the IDD mill levy work is now coming under the community initiative unit. Community initiative unit was just um, made and it is led by Whitney Wilcox and you guys probably all know her with the Family Resource Network. And that's been a very positive move. And I think there was a question, but I didn't see it. Um, I think Adriana asked, how can uh, participants get registered to those Ooh. trainings? For the training, they should contact me and mm -hmm. um, our siden at bouldercounty.gov, and I can put them on our mailing list for the training. Do you mind adding your <clears throat> your information I to sure the chat? Will. And then uh, Robert is saying, I facilitate a monthly brain injury support group at Boulder Community Health. We usually meet on the third Thursday of each month, but the June meeting will be changed due to an event that takes place on that day. <clears throat> I'll just adjust the flyer soon. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Robert. I would love to get, um, I can also put things like that on our website. And also I do attend many a resource fair in Boulder mm -hmm. County and can also provide um, more advertisement of your sessions as well. Awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. You're very welcome. Um, Thank you. In the interest of time, we're going to move to the next um, update. Um, our next um, person is uh, Carly Marquis. She is going to tell us a little bit about Cultivate and Let's Go. There. Hi. Okay, one second, let me get my, is there, uh, can I share the screen? Uh, yeah, we can, we can stop our sharing and then um, I think you should be able to share. Okay. Let me know if you can't. I think you should. Okay. Good. Can you see? Yeah. Um, so um, I'm here from Cultivate. We are a nonprofit that serves seniors, anyone 60 years of age and better. I'm specifically going to be addressing the Vets Go program um, for anybody who's not familiar with it, but I always like to start with the fact that we serve um, people to help them age in place. So all of our programs are um, hoping to engage people 60 years of age and better who want to remain where they are in their homes assisted living, independent living without seeking higher levels of care, especially higher levels of paid care. And transportation is a huge part of that. Um, we have our program called Vets Go. Um, there's only one of our programs. We do all kinds of other things, grocery shopping, um, home repairs, snow removal, yard work, and friendly phone calls. Um, but I'm going to, again, be focusing just on Vets Go um, with some updates. So, um, we give rides to veterans and veteran family members. Um, so that's the specific group that we do serve. Um, and in 2022, we gave over 2,000 escorted medical rides um, and helped 141 clients. All of these rides are provided by volunteers. So it is a free service by background check volunteers covered by our supplemental insurance. Um, 
cut them into the next one to give you an idea. So the rides are one-on-one -on -one provided by the volunteers um, own cars. Right now, we're currently averaging about 40 hour or 40 rides a week um, mm -hmm. that are requested of us. And we are able to cover most of them. The problem is, is that it is dependent on volunteers. So sometimes we are unable mm -hmm. to fulfill a ride. We have to give the, um, we give the client as much notice as possible to allow for um, them to find an, either reschedule or find another person to give them a ride. And we will go anywhere that is a medical appointment, physical therapy, dialysis. We have a number of dialysis clients that go three times a week with us. Um, but we will also go to, you know, mental health appointments. It doesn't necessarily have to be at a medical facility. We can go see someone who's seeing like a therapist or a counselor mm -hmm. at a senior center or something like that. We can help with that as well. So we've been expanding. We've also been able to expand with dialysis. Um, if somebody does need a dialysis right on a Saturday, we are able to make that work. Um, in the past, it was just Monday through Friday, but um, we can work with people for a Saturday appointment on that. Um, our current changes and challenges. So due to a reduction in funding, we have had to reduce some of our uh, uh, reimbursement. We do reimburse 35 cents on the mile for our volunteers. Um, that does still cover their gas, uh, but that is a, a decrease from 55 or 45 cents on the mile in Boulder County, 55 cents outside. We also used mm -hmm. to give a vehicle maintenance reimbursement for out-of-county rides, equivalent to $25. We've had to stop doing that program as well. Um, that was anticipated. The money for that was a limited period of time we were able to provide. So um, we did have to, to stop with that. One of the biggest challenges we're discovering is that we're, um, we don't have as many consistent volunteers as we need. We have 40 volunteers that are actively participating in the program, but a lot of people give one ride every three or four months, which isn't making um, as much of a dent as we need. So one of the big changes is we're trying to put it out there that we have you know the ideal volunteer, somebody who is willing to give a ride once a week, somebody who's willing to drive 30 minutes there and back, um, and uh, really has a heart for connection. Half of what we do is surface, half of what we do is that connection, that one-on-one -on -one that the, the volunteers and clients have. Um, so those are kind of some of our, our biggest changes recently. The last thing I wanted to put out here um, is why we do this. So this is John Gores. He passed away recently. He was a client of ours who we took to dialysis. Um, four of our drivers went to his service and also um, in lieu of flowers, they asked to donate to Cultivate at his service as well this year. So um, while we are low, you know, we, while our funding is, is decreasing, while we are encountering challenges um, and looking for more volunteers, we do have really amazing volunteers who provide really important services to our veteran community. Oh, awesome. Thanks for sharing, Carly. And uh, I'm excited to meet one of your uh, volunteer drivers next week because she um, she will be one of our um, models for the campaign and um, understanding that the need for volunteer drivers is big like you mentioned so we want to promote that service. Um, Corey had a question in the chat yeah. is the vet school program only eligible to Boulder County veterans or does it include Weld and Broomfield as well? Great question. So we, um, this program specifically is in Boulder and Broomfield counties. Um, it is not technically in Weld. What I will say is that we do, we are now able to offer some of our other programs in Weld County, which means we do have a little bit of funding there. So we are not as hard and fast on the county line with Weld. So, you know, Weld parts of Longmont, Weld parts of Erie, um, right on, off that county line, we can work and generally work with people. Whereas in the past, if they were anywhere past that line, we weren't able to help. Okay. Um, would you mind adding all the you know important links and your information in the chat just for people if they're interested in reaching to you? Definitely, we'll do. Awesome. And same, uh, oh, Rebecca, I saw that you already added your um, email, but if you wanna add the website, the link to your website, that'll be great. Thank you so much, Carly, for your update. Um, okay, moving on. So the next item in the agenda are our presentations. So we have uh, Stacy Proctor, who's gonna tell us a little bit more about the Colorado Y19 uh, project that she's been working on for a while. And then we'll hear from Alexandra Phillips on the North Folk Hills Bikeway Feasibility Study, and then Tanya Lubert on the BERT. So, um, Stacy, do you want to 
Take yeah, it go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, it's great to be here. I know I've presented, I think, on this project a while ago, maybe a year or more ago, um, but I'm Stacey Proctor and I'm the project manager for the design of the 119 Bikeway Project, um, which is a um, bikeway <clears throat> that'll be between Boulder and Longmont mostly in the median between the, um, the north and southbound lanes of the diagonal highway. And um, we are kind of um, working together with RTD and CDOT and Longmont. Um, and so kind of renamed the project as the 119 Safety Mobility and Bikeway Project. So we're moving forward with um, constructing the project all at once. So um, you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, this, yeah, sorry, next slide. <laughs> Um, so just um, wanted to give just a high level idea of, you know, really who we're working with. So we have a, a big team, um, lots of people working. So we're working with um, CDOT, um, has several people who are kind of helping from an engineering standpoint. And then um, myself is kind of the Boulder County lead. Ali Amansapahi is on from RTD today and that might have a couple of things to add. And then um, also working with City of Longmont. So it's a real... Um, multi-jurisdictional, multi-agency project, and we're um, meeting every week and, and coordinating closely together. Uh, next slide. Um, and then we have a, a great team. Um, we have a design engineer, and then we're doing a, a called a construction manager, general contractor. So Kramer is kind of helping us with how can we build this for a lower cost? Are there different innovative ideas? Are there better ways to construct things? So they've been working with us on that. And then um, we have some other um, people who are kind of helping along the way. So it's a really big team, a lot of people working on this project um, and just wanted to kind of give a flavor of, of who's all working on this. Um, so next, next slide. And then we're also um, working with City of Boulder and Commuting Solutions are some key stakeholders as well. And we're working closely with them. So the reason for this project on 119 is really that we have um, a lot of safety challenges and, and um, safety issues on this corridor. So it's really the highest crash corridor for vehicles and the second highest crash corridor for bicyclists in the county. And so um, a main focus of this project is to address safety for all people using all loads along the corridor. Next slide. Um, and then in addition to that, we also have a lot of mobility challenges on the corridor. So right now there is no separate bike facility. Um, there is a, a shoulder on the bike or on the side of the road that some people who are what we call the fearless bike riders are, are out there riding it. Um, but for the, for the general kind of casual commuter, it's not really something that feels safe. And so, um, this project will address that. Um, the transit service, uh, the Bolt service can be slow and travel times are unreliable, uh, but with this project we're doing, making a lot of transit improvements that are expected to cut transit travel times in half um, along the corridor, so making it you know, pretty much competitive with driving a personal vehicle. And then um, just looking at some other ways to improve the, the corridor with, with um, the anticipated in, increased traffic to kind of mitigate some of the, the traffic challenges that we have. The next slide. Um, one thing that we did um, or CDOT did last fall was a rumble strip um, and some signing and striping was updated along the corridor last fall. So you can see they put these little, their little grooves basically in the, um, in the shoulder so that a vehicle, if they, you know, drift outside of the travel lane or the driving lane, they'll feel that bump and, and hopefully get back into the driving lane before um, hitting anybody on the shoulder. So um, that was implemented last fall. Um, and then I know this is a lot of information on this slide and, and I won't go into too much detail about it. And I'm happy to talk to anybody more about all the different things we're planning to do on the corridor, but this is a really big project. Um, we're making a lot of improvements along the whole diagonal corridor. Um, and, in, you know, as I said, for both for transit, bicyclists or bike facilities, and then also roadway and uh, safety improvements. Um, so this just kind of gives a flavor of all of the things that we're, we're doing. There'll be um, a new park and ride at 63rd, expansion of the park and ride at Niwot, 
Um, we'll have Q bypass lanes. So basically um, separate lanes for um, the transit vehicles or buses to go in so that they don't have to sit in traffic. So they'll kind of get a, um, a, a fast pass through those intersections and that's what helps them move at the same same speed as the vehicles with the stops that they need to do. Um, and then we'll have um, some other transit stops along the road. Hover is a whole big big project there as well. So lots of things are gonna be happening along uh, the corridor. Uh, next slide, yeah. So yeah, this, this map just kind of shows the corridor and what improvements we're looking at at each of the intersections and, and all along the corridor. So, um, there'll be, you know, things happening big and small, and you may you may notice them, and some things you may not notice because um, they'll be um, kind of smaller smaller improvements, but lots of things happening all along the corridor. <clears throat> and then this, uh, we're getting into the transit, and I know I think Ali is here, and so is Natalie. Ellie, would you want to talk a little bit about this these next couple of slides? Sure. Uh, so Natalie, I believe Natalie's with us too. I'm pretty sure she is. Yeah. yeah. But so I'll start it off and then hand it hand it off to um, Natalie for more details in case anybody is interested. But as far as RTD is concerned, this uh, SMBP or Safety Mobility and Bikeway project that takes care of the diagonal piece, as you see uh, between. Uh, Foothills Parkway to the south and Hover Street to the north, but then RTD goes beyond that because we have to serve our patrons in both uh, Longmont and Boulder. And that's where you see the two variations of the BRT, two separate um, patterns, if you will, of uh, the BRT, the orange and the blue, serving um, all the way from North Longmont, including that planned park ridge park and ride uh, off of Highway 66, all the way down to CU uh, campus, um, being served by the Orange Route, and then downtown Boulder being served by the uh, Blue Route. Um, that, um, the slide really tells the whole story. You could see uh, by the designations of letter P, where the planned park and rides are going to be, the two in the diagonal plus the one I already mentioned at Park Ridge. Um, you could see the uh, other planned mobility hubs such as First and Main. Um, that's um, a, a separate project that the city of Longmont is uh, spearheading. Um, plus um, the uh, planned stations um, along the diagonal as well as the BRT stops in both cities of Boulder and Longmont. With that, um, I would ask Natalie if uh, she would like to add anything in. Yeah, and yeah. I think we have like a slide about the um, park and ride. This one. Oh yeah. Want to talk well, anything about you, that? And then the next slide has. Quick, oh yeah, the service planning okay. study is the. There's some slides on the or slide on the service. Planning yeah, study. let me just just to just to make sure everybody's oh, ahead, aware of it. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, for the orange line, what we show for Boulder is most likely not what's going to come into play. We're working with the city of Boulder on a study to evaluate how to best serve main campus, both campuses versus just going to East campus. Um, the routing has not been finalized, but at this point, we're not looking to start the service with the routing to East campus, but rather to stay more focused on 28th street in that vicinity and uh, allow closer connections to main campus. We probably actually should update this map, but we haven't gotten the final go from City of Boulder on that yet. So we're waiting, hopefully in the next week or two, we have that. Great, thank you, Natalie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, do you wanna to go to the next slide? And I, Ali, did you wanna add anything about the- uh, This is just a planned parking ride, the one that you saw in the previous slide on uh, off of Highway 66 at Park Ridge. Um, this, uh, the story behind this is that this, this was a part of the um, agreement between the city of Longmont and the developer at the time, which was Walmart. And then in the, you know, some, I want to say 20, 2004, 2005 timeframe, 
where at the time um, it was uh, decided that um, the parking right was going to go here and uh, a four acre lot was going to be uh, deeded over to RTD eventually to build a parking right on. And then uh, the ownership has changed. Uh, Walmart sold uh, all of the, uh, the land that you see on both sides of 287 to um, developer. And now we're in the process of, they have to follow through and, um, um, you know, with, with, a, with the original con a contract to fulfill the, the requirements of it. And as part of that, we are in negotiations with the developer to acquire the, uh, the four acre lot that you see. Um, on the sort of the, the gray part on the right side of 287. Great, thanks. Thanks, Ali. Sure. And then, yeah, we can, I guess we talked about the service pattern study. Natalie, thanks for adding that. So we go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to get in a little bit of detail about the commuter bikeway. We are um, based on our final in, um, engineering. We get into um, some changes. I wanted to talk a little bit about that, but um, the idea for the bike path would, is that it would be um, separated from the road, um, usable all year round, ADA accessible. Um, we're looking at 12 feet wide for the most part. And then in some areas it'll be um, wider in the more crowded areas around the transit stops and that sort of stuff. So it'll be um, 16 feet in those areas. Um, next slide. So um, one of the things that we ran into is a, a water line um, right along. Oh, this my slide got messed up. The, the water line is actually right, um, right along 63rd. And so if you go to the next slide, you can see that um, after evaluating all of our alternatives, um, we found out it would cost over $3 million to move the water line. And so um, we are looking now at recommending an overpass in this location. Um, so that we don't have that conflict. And we had some other challenges with groundwater in this area. So um, we're right now um, working through our land use process to amend our um, amend the, the land use application that we have to approve um, this change. But you can see on the left-hand side is the um, kind of existing view if you were driving southbound on 119, approaching 63rd. And then the right-hand side is a photo simulation of an example type of overpass. This is not what um, the exact design would look like. It's just there to kind of show the size and the scale and the visual impact um, of, of what an overpass would look like in this location. Um, and assuming we make we get through our land use process, then we would move forward with design and definitely want to get input from the community on what what it would look like, what the aesthetics would be, um, you know, what material, what what it, you know, just what it would look like and how it would feel and what people would like to see in the um, for that to look like within the community. So we're moving forward with that um, and hoping to uh, begin design on that this summer um, once we get the approval. And then we had another waterline conflict that with with similar cost um, increases that um, we decided to look at alternatives for the alignment as well. So these were some options that we looked at um, to get across Four Mile Canyon Creek, which is right at the south end of the project near the diagonal crossing development. People know where that is, uh, right at the, the beginning of the foothills, or right at the beginning of the diagonal highway. Um, so if you go to the next slide. Um, so what we're recommending uh, moving forward with is uh, this crossing the, um, at the Four Mile Canyon, Cornell Canyon Creek crossing right here, um, basically in between the north and southbound lanes of 119. Um, and so we would um, have a low water crossing, which I'll, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, and um, to get across the creek. And then we would grade um, everything beyond that where you see kind of the rocks and stuff are there to get up to, um, up to the ground level. Um, it would be ADA compliant at 5% or less and would avoid the water line and avoid the need for an underpass and the bridge and um, you know, it was a um, big cost savings. So we're again, moving through our land use uh, review process for that. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide. So um, this just kind of shows 
kind of at high water what that crossing would look like. And then the next slide has, these are kind of what low water crossings look like. So this is again, just an example of kind of what, um, what a low water crossing looks like. Um, and then we have been um, working with the Niwa uh, community to look at some op options for an underpass that would connect the bikeway and the RTT, RTD park and ride at Niwa to Second Avenue, which is basically the main street in Niwa. So we've, we're looking at kind of these three alternatives and um, working through the process of identifying which one is the best um, and moving forward with design on that. We don't currently have funding for this underpass, but we're um, continuing to seek funding and hoping um, that we will be able to find the, the funding and we can construct it along with everything else that we're building um, on the corridor. Okay, um, let's skip this. I know I'm running a little over on time, so I wanna make sure I get to, um, let's, we can skip this one too, funding. Um, wanted to just let people know kind of when they can expect construction to begin. So we are working on three different construction packages. And so um, we have NTP means notice to proceed. So we're hoping to begin construction on most of the corridor starting in September of this year. And then um, those areas that I was mentioning that have gotten changed, we, we still need to do the, do the design for those. And so we would hope to begin those next summer. And then the 119 and Hover intersection is um, still kind of going through alternatives and, and we'll be beginning design, but we're not really quite sure when we'll start construction on that. But estimating that the total construction for the um, corridor will be 24 to 30 months. And here's just some contact information for the team. So feel free to reach out, um, reach out to us if you have questions and I'm, I know I don't have a lot of time, but if there's any questions um, for me, I am happy to answer those now. Yeah, and we can add all of those links to the chat too, so that you have easier access to yeah, them. Yeah, easier access, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you also have to go to another meeting, but I want to open it up. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Stacy? It's a very big project and there's a lot of components to it. And um, it's interesting to see the amount of partnerships and um, portions to to this project. So any questions? I guess I have a quick question. Um, how can people provide input on the design of the overpass? Um, great, yeah, great question. So yeah, once, you know, once we kind of get through the process of seeing if we can get approval to move forward with that, we'll, um, work with our consultant to do some alternatives, so some example ideas, and then we'll um, bring those to the community. We're anticipating August, we'll have um, some uh, meetings with the community, and hopefully we'll generally we do a survey um, and we do outreach so people can kind of provide their input without having to come to a meeting. Um, so we have an email list that you can find on our website if people want to um, get added to that list to kind of know when, when those things are happening. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Stacy. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks for your presentation. Yeah, feel free to reach out with any other questions. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so our next person presenter is Alexandra Phillips, and I know we're running a little bit short on time. Um, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know, we have three more presentations. One okay. is Alexandra's, Tanya's, and then uh, Kim's. Mm -hmm. So Alexandra, do you want to go next? Yes, sure. Oh, I thought, are you going to be sharing my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, wait. Maya, are you able to do that? I can do it. Um, I didn't have slides for her presentation. They were, yeah. It was um, the same one. Right, yeah, oh. the same, yeah, ours were all in one. Mm -hmm. There it is. Oh, yeah. that's smart. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, so I'll go through this quickly, but feel free to um, ask questions at the end or contact me for more questions. So um, the North Foothills Bikeway Feasibility Study, it's the road US 36 between Boulder and Lyons. And the main reason for going forward with this study was the crashes. 30% of the bike related crashes that happened in a 10 year period 
in Boulder County happened on this road, 30% in unincorporated county. So that's not counting the cities. Um, and there's a lot of cyclists on this road and a lot of drivers, a lot of people driving. Next mm -hmm. slide. Mm -hmm. So this is um, a map of it and north is to the right. So if you tilt your head like that, if you're one of those people that need north to the top, if you just tilt your head, it'll north will be at the top. And um, as you can see, a lot of the land on either side of the road is either owned by City of Boulder, open, um, open space in Mountain Parks, Boulder County, um, a lot of private land. So we're working very closely with all, um, all those entities and CDOT also owns the right of way. So we're working with them. And after a lot of collaboration, um, the main stem of the bikeway alignment is mostly going to be on the south side of the road as it's shown on this map. And the blue bubbles um, are actually just about um, less than two miles of the total 10 and, a, 10 and a half mile corridor, 10 and a half mile corridor. And those are bubbles that we need to do um, further analysis to figure out the exact alignment. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So this is the list of the steering committee members and um, you'll uh, shown on the slide before is um, kind of showing why these people, uh, why these organizations need to be in the steering committee. And for some reason, I always forget the town of Lyons, which is um, awful of me. Sorry for always forgetting the town of Lyons. They've been really instrumental in uh, working with us. Next slide. So what we know um, from lots of different studies is that um, there's types of different types of cyclists and the type of cyclist who's going to ride on a high volume road with top speeds, we typically call them the strong and fearless. Uh, Stacy alluded to that earlier, but the bikeway that we want to build here would also appeal to the enthusiastic and confident and the interested but concerned. And the interested but concerned are the folks that are only comfortable on like the center photo with a, a bike path completely removed from traffic, but are really interested and want to ride more, but um, don't want to ride on the roads. Next slide. So with all that, were um, certain design considerations, locating the bikeway, mostly within CDOT right of way. And we have to also look at how it's um, crossing driveways and at grade intersections to make sure that that's safe. And we're aiming for a hard surface bikeway that's plowed in winter for year round use. Um, and I'm gonna skip some of these bullet points, but the last one, um, the use of guardrails and barriers between the road and bikeway when there's not enough right of way. Um, I'll go into that more in the next couple of slides if you can move on. Thanks, oops, this one's coming up, <laughs> sorry. Um, this is the, um, the study outcomes and the study will be done in July and the study will give us this conceptual alignment and also tell us where those barriers will have to be and where there's enough right away to not have the barriers. Next slide. So here's what um, I was alluding to a minute ago. So there's quite a bit um, of the bike of the roadway that allows us to have a 20 foot separation between the vehicles and the bikeway. We looked at having a 30 foot separation, but we ran into um, too much right away limitations. But in this photo, you can see that it's a relatively flat topography. There's not a lot of hills or slopes, um, but anyone who's paying attention as you're riding or driving along that road, there's a lot of topography, very interesting and challenging topography. So this um, we this is the what we can do for parts of it. Next slide. And this is where, if there's not enough separation, um, we'll put in the barriers to um, accommodate that. Next slide. And so pretty much it breaks down to 64% of the 10 and a half miles is this situation where we it's flat enough and we have the 20 feet separation. And then there's other parts either do um, because of limited right of way or, and or the topography that we'll be putting, we'll be needing to do retaining walls and barriers and or barriers. Next slide. 
So here's where we're at right now. The feasibility study is funded and will be completed in just a, a few months. Um, and then we'll be moving on to the next phases of design and um, hopefully finally construction. Those phases are not yet funded. Next slide. So um, a whole bunch of stuff on this slide. There's the website, the web page within the Boulder County where you can go for more information. You can sign up for e-news alerts. You can contact me directly. I'm the project manager. I don't even remember if I actually introduced myself. I was trying to cut, cut the time, but I'm, I'm Alexandra, the project manager. Um, we've already done some um, public presentations and the recording of the present of the remote pub presentation we did is on the website. We'll have some upcoming public meetings to the City of Boulder, Transportation Advisory Board, and others. And we'll also be presenting to the Board of County Commissioners sometime in August. That date will be set soon. Um, and um, that's it. Oh, and the survey too will be on the website is on the website to fill out a very short survey about the bike to get your feedback on the bike way. Um, mm -hmm. That's it. Do we have time for questions? I believe we do. And uh, we will add those links too, uh, mm -hmm. to the chat. Maybe somebody from my team can do that. Um, does anybody have any questions for Alexandra about this project? I can't really see the chat since I'm sharing, but um, we can speak up. Let's see. Oh, here's the chat. Questions going once. Um. Wait. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, what about? Can you tell us a little bit more about this survey, Alexandra? Mm -hmm. There's the link on the survey at the very top of the web page. And it's going to be up there for um, another week or so. So it's getting towards the end of where I'm going to end it. But it just takes a few minutes to fill out. To, um, and anyone can fill it out if you're a, um, a cyclist or an interested but concerned cyclist or you're not a cyclist. Um, so it'll be up there for just about another two weeks to fill out before we um, take all those responses and put it into the final report. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, now we're going to move on to our next presenter, uh, Tanya. Do you want to tell us about your project and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya Lubert. I'm the Regional Trails Planner, um, and I am the project manager for the Boulder to Erie Regional Trail, um, which we fondly call the BERT. Um, go, on. go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so it's so just a very high level project overview for the sake of time. Um, we are in the planning process, so which is the first development or first step in trail development um, to develop or to identify needs, opportunities and, and constraints of constructing the regional trail and, and work with project partners and the community on what they would like that trail to, to be. Um, and so we're evaluating options um, for the creation of this new accessible soft surface regional trail, um, which will link the, the city of Boulder um, to the town of Erie. Um, and that's about an eight and a half mile long corridor from 61st Street in Boulder, right around um, Valmont Road where, where 61st meets Valmont, um, to all the way east to County Line Road in, in Erie. Um, and the idea originally was to follow the former um, UP rail line, which is now owned um, by RTD. Um, so it's a it's a rail corridor. It's not abandoned, but it is it hasn't been used for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, so the purpose is is to create a, a low stress east west trail connection within eastern uh, Boulder County. Um, right now, there isn't really one of those available, um, and, uh, you know, it isn't getting from Erie to Boulder and vice versa on a bike isn't really possible, except for those that are fearless on a, on a bicycle. So, go ahead and go. Ahead and go. Um, 
the brave and the fearless or is that how yes <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't do it <laughs> um so the the planning process has gone on for a while and and partially that is due to um expanded project scope um, due to concerns from stakeholders and um, the Board of County Commissioners. Um, and so to address some of those um, concerns, um, which were mainly environmental in nature, um, we are considering additional or uh, in the process of considering additional alignments outside the original RTD corridor that I just described. Um, and so we are looking at um, road right of way as an option, which would still be separated from from the the road. It's, we're not talking about like a a shoulder, a bikeable shoulder. We're talking about a separated path. Um, and then the other option would be to use um, City of Boulder open space and mountain park lands um, for certain for certain sections um, where we have the most environmental concern, which is mainly if you're familiar with the area between 75th and 95th. Um, and then another way we're addressing those concerns was we created this very um, in-depth and robust evaluation criteria process um, to take alignments um, through, take our preferred or conceptual alignments through to determine preferred alignment. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so the corridors that we originally looked at were, you know, still looking at the um, RT rail corridor, and then those white dashed lines that you can see in the top map, um, those were the options on OSMP uh, property, City of Boulder, Open Space and Mountain Parks property. Um, and then the yellow line was the Valmont-Isabel um, road corridor. Um, and we narrowed, we were able to narrow those down um, through public involvement and, and steering committee input um, to and, and further evaluation by the, the project team um, to three conceptual alignments, um, which are shown in the bottom map. Um, so basically just looking at uh, alternative alignments in that 75th to 95th section, um, which include um, an alignment um, with OSMP property, and then the third or and the third alignment would be to go down 95th along Valmont, and then or sorry, down 75th along Valmont, and then up 95th to connect back to the rail corridor. Go ahead. Um, then the other tool that we're using to um, address those environmental concerns is a robust evaluation criteria process. So this is what we use to evaluate those three conceptual alignments that I just showed you um, to determine um, what our preferred alignment would be. Um, so the evaluation criteria were based on, on the project goals and the goals were to provide a safe, low stress connection between Boulder and Erie um, that is multi-use and accessible for both transportation and recreational users. Um, and, you know, we've also been approaching the project through the lenses of trail user experiment experience and environmental, cultural, and adjacent property considerations. Oops. Go ahead. Um, and so those broad evaluation criteria categories um, are safety, uh, resource considerations, so that includes um, environmental and cultural resources, um, implementation and maintenance. Um, so we need a, a trail that's um, feasible, <laughs> um, both to implement and also maintain. Um, and adjacent property considerations. There's a lot of private property owners and a lot of open space um, property along this rail corridor. Um, and then of course, trail user experience. Um, so is this gonna be a comfortable trail and safe for, for users? Uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, upcoming, upcoming timeline, um, our final op public open house is going to be in August. Um, and then September, the public uh, will uh, have the opportunity to review the draft master plan. Also in September, uh, we'll be presenting to all the open, or most of the open space board um, 
open space boards in the county, um, including Boulder County, um, POZAC, City of Boulder, OSBT, and then ERIES um, OSTAT. Um, and then October, we will hopefully be taking the 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 master plan or the the final BERT plan to um, the BUCC for the public hearing. And then hopefully in 2025, we'll be beginning preliminary design. So that was very quick, a little overview. Um, and I, I put um, the project website um, on this page as well as my contact information. Tanya, do you have a specific time and date set for the pub final public meeting in August? Great question. We do not yet. Um, I it's, this is fine. I can respond to this. We, we are um, looking at the uh, last week in August, likely. Um, but we we do not have a specific date um, yet. And it will likely be in person. Um, we had uh, over 130 people <laughs> at our last uh, public meeting in, in September of 2023. Um, so we will likely have that be in person as well in August. Um, I have one more question, Tanya. Um, are you looking to get feedback from the community and how can people give input or make suggestions? Um, yeah. Um, so if you go to the project website, if you go back um, to the previous slide that has the yeah. link to the project website, um, there is um, a specific uh, page on that, or uh, I always get the it's two tab. confused. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there's a tab on there. Um, and, um, or you can just email me directly with any input or questions. Um, the the web page also has a, um, a pretty, big uh, frequently asked questions um, just because this planning process has been going on for a while. So we've got all sorts of questions and we try to um, add those to the um, the FAQ um, if we can. Um, and yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Elaine, if so, you um, turning on your video, did you have a question? I did. Tanya, do you have any idea if we're leaning more towards a soft surface or a paved trail? I know for commuting, there's a, a preference maybe for the hard surface that helps with that, but um, I didn't know if any further discussion had happened. Yeah, um, we we are leaning towards a, um, the goal of this is, is a regional trail um, and so therefore um, will be a soft surface trail. It is very rural in nature um, with a lot of agricultural and um, open space on either side. Um, and, um, you know, we do, we do hear that the, the um, hard surface is a desire, um, but we're hoping that other projects in Eastern Boulder County that are going on right now, like the Colorado 7, um, project, I'm not getting the name right, someone else <laughs> can, um, but they, um, that will hopefully be including a multi-use path um, that will be better for commuting. Um, and regional trails, um, Boulder County regional trails are often used for both commuting and recreation um, and are usually very multi-purpose and um, they allow for um, equestrian use and um, as snowshoeing and and cross country skiing in the winter, um, so and you know there will probably be sections that um, are hard surface, you know, like the underpass under two eighty seven, um, or if we're trying to avoid wet areas or something like that, um, you know, it could even be like a boardwalk in certain sections. Um, but largely, uh, it will be soft surface, meaning crusher fine, so very compacted and still accessible. Yeah, thanks for the questions. And um, we're gonna move on to our last presentation of the day. Uh, we have Kim uh, Christensen, and she's gonna tell us a little bit more about the United Way 211 call center. Uh, Kim, I don't know if you had your own slides that you wanted to share or- Yes, um, 
I yeah, do. You did. Sorry okay. about that. I just did not get no. them sent over in time. So I'll go ahead and share a screen if that's all right and share the presentation mm -hmm. that way. All righty. Yeah. Let's make sure. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Can everybody see that okay? Uh, yes. Okay. Awesome. Let's see if I can go full screen here. Um, all right. Now is that full screen? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, my name is Kim Christensen. I work at Mile High United Way. I am the manager of disaster response for our organization. Um, and our disaster response program is housed within 211 Colorado, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so if we were not virtual, I would ask everyone to raise their hand if they had heard of 211. So if you want to drop a yes or no in the chat or virtually raise your hand, feel free. Um, but 211 is a multilingual and confidential service that connects people to critical resources. We have over 9,000 resources in our database, and they range um, a number of services, rent assistance, um, utility bill assistance, food assistance, you know, to help folks meet their basic needs. Um, I started at United Way actually as a community resource navigator. Um, so I was someone who took these calls Monday through Friday from eight to five. Um, and although, you know, we're meeting those basic needs, we also get interesting requests as well. And I think one day we had an elderly gentleman call me and he um, needed help walking his dogs. And we actually had a resource for that. So it, it really varies. Um, and we're just a, th a three digit number that you can call for any human services need. So again, that's 211, it's a number you can dial. Um, so to kind of just touch on our relationship with 988 and 911, um, of course 911 is for emergencies and 988 is for mental health crises. Um, and so we're, you know, with the partnerships we have with those uh, two phone numbers, we're hoping to provide whole person care. Um, and so, you know, if someone calls into 211 and maybe is kind of in an escalated state and needs more assistance from 988, we can transfer them directly there and same with 911. Um, and then also those two agencies can direct people to 211 if they need more wraparound services and resources. So just briefly want to touch on here again, these top needs that we see from our community, food, housing and shelter, utility assistance, healthcare services, and of course, transportation, as you all are aware. So I'm going to keep moving here. Um, this is kind of a brief explanation of what it could look like calling into 211. Um, and just for time purposes, I may kind of move forward from this. But just basically, again, to remind you all, we're open Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. Someone can call in with whatever need they may have, and we're going to give them a list of resources that can help. And so that can be, you know, we give those resources over the phone. We can email those resources or text the resources uh, to the person. Um, and then we also have a follow-up process where if they opt in, we can either text or call them in four weeks to see how their experience was, but then to also see if the resources they were provided um, met their needs, which is a good way to you know, see our impact on our community and how well it's working. All right, and here is just some monthly contact volume. The, in short, we have seen increases. <laughs> so each year we get more and more calls and that's partly from outreach like this, but also, you know, we see needs in our community increasing. Um, apologies for the bad format here, but these are what we call met needs. So someone can call in again for whatever they may need and we can track that in our database. So we have a database again of 9,000 resources. When someone calls in, we collect their information. Um, we give them resources, and then we use that data to identify what areas in the community uh, we need the most help. So we have met needs, of course, which is, that means that we could find resources for this need. So if you called in and needed rent assistance, we found a resource for it. If you called in and we could not find a resource for it, that's an unmet need. Um, and so our top unmet need um, from 2022 to, excuse me, for 2023 um, was transitional housing. So again, our unhoused community across Metro Denver. I'm gonna, sorry, I'm talking rapidly and going through this rapidly. I wanna make sure we have a couple of minutes for questions and everything. So, um, all right, great. Um, now more talking, so in times of crisis and disaster. So again, that's kind of the program that I oversee. Um, and 211 can kind of leverage 
itself as a call center in times of crisis and disaster, but also, you know, one place where you can upload any and all resources in times of disaster and anyone can call in and get the same resources. So I was a navigator in 2021 um, during the Marshall Fire. And so at that time, we had navigators who went to the Disaster Assistance Center, and we were able to give resources to folks, and those resources can be uploaded in real time. So once we figured out what resources became available after that disaster, we contacted our database team, and they uploaded those resources. Um, we have a full database team that calls the resources that we add to verify that they're real, and then continue it, like yearly reaches out to them to provide updates to make sure that all of the resources in our database are up to date. Um, and so again, here are some things that 211 can do in disaster. Create a central repository for resource information, AKA 211 resource guides. The most recent example of this is um, the newcomer influx that we're seeing in Denver in particular. We're creating um, newcomer and new immigrant resource guides and that's on our website and then we share them with community partners. Um, and I'm going to continue on just because for time purposes. <laughs> um, so these are some direct offerings that we can make today. And I think that the one that's most relevant for this group is our Ride United program, which can be found here on the second bullet. So we have a partnership with United Way Worldwide, and they provide funding to us to provide free lift rides to community members in need. This is statewide, however, Lyft is not available in some rural communities. Um, and I guess I should start by saying Lyft is a rideshare program if anyone is not familiar. Um, and so if someone has an app, they can enter in the address they need to go to and pay for a ride. And so instead of you know our clients paying for the rides, we take care of that cost and we help them meet basic needs like doctor's appointments, um, accessing public benefits, getting to work, getting to school, whatever their need may be. Um, basically, you're eligible if you need a ride and it's for a basic need. The only thing we wouldn't um, send through is like, I need to go get my hair cut. Okay, well, that's not really a basic need, right? So we may look um, for something else. So that being said, we have funding throughout all of our fiscal year. And if there are lifts available in your area, we can provide those lift rides. Um, so again, in really rural Colorado, that may not be an option, but in the metro area, it's more common. Um, and I have a one pager about this and I'll make sure to send to you, Jessica, if we're gonna send it out to everyone on the call, um, just that kind of breaks it down. We also do have other transportation resources in our database. So if there's, you know, nonprofits in certain areas that have RTD bus passes or, you know, bus fare assistance, um, our database, I should add to, is statewide. So this is not just for Denver, but also reaches into Boulder and places like that. Um, lastly, I want to hit on two that we have um, recently received a grant. And so we have packets of RTD bus passes. Um, and I know they're for Denver, but I don't know if we have any, you know, different coordinators from across the state or if it's all just Boulder on this call. So I wanted to add that. And if you want more information about that, we can provide more. Um, so briefly touch on a couple more things as well. We can help folks fill out SNAP applications. So if you call in, um, we'll sit down for 10, 20 minutes with you, fill out the application, and it's sent directly to your county's DHS. And so uh, it's sent directly there for processing and approval. So we just help fill out the applications. We also have a tri child care resource and referral line. We know child care is a massive need in our community um, across the state, and there's not a lot of child care, and it's very expensive. Um, and so we help families identify. We can provide them a list of all the child care um, resources within like a 20 mile radius or whatever they would want to see. We send that list to them. We can also help call those child care providers to see if they have availability for the age of children um, that the callers are calling in about. Um, and we also um, connect people to CCAP resources, which is a subsidy given to help pay for child care costs. And lastly, um, TransPerfect. This is a translation, translation service. Um, and so if someone calls in, if you could be a caseworker and you call in, let's say you're working with someone who speaks Spanish and you don't speak Spanish. It could be as simple as that. And you need translation services. We can route you to TransPerfect and you'll, we'll have a live translator on the line. Um, and that also is helpful in disaster. If you have you know, populations of people that speak many different languages, we can accommodate up to 200 or more languages. And so even if 
that's all you're using 2114, we want to be there to support. All righty, moving on to partnerships. This is just kind of, we partner locally, statewide, and federally and national, right? So we have um, partners in all areas, and I'm going to keep moving through. So time for questions. This is just at a glance numbers um, from fiscal year 2023 for crisis or disaster response. And one number I want to highlight is we completed 1,500 follow-up or outbound calls to um, people impacted by the Marshall Fire. So we con we contacted them. It was a part of like a you know long-term recovery effort to see how those people were doing. So 2 assisted in that, which is also a great thing to know in times of disaster, that follow-up is where 2 can help with. Let's keep moving. This is just a, a nice note from Jerry Curry, who is the Marshall Rock Executive Director. Um, and just her experience with 211, and she says a lot of nice things. So if we provide the slides, please do read it. <laughs> For time purposes, I'm going to keep going. Um, and again, our refugee and new immigrant population is kind of, while it's not a declared disaster, it's a disaster that we're seeing specifically in our Denver area. Um, and so here are just some numbers um, from the past year. And again, this number here, 2,600 resource connections um, to new immigrant families. And so 211 is kind of that hub where we have a bunch of resources, a bunch of information, and we do our best to get that information to the correct people. So um, some advocacy opportunities. If you want to learn more about 211, I know today was just a really brief overview and I talked so fast at you, so I apologize in advance. Um, but please contact me. My email will be at the end of the slide and I'll send it in the chat. But we also, you, you can come and do a tour. You can do a live call shadowing experience if you wanna hear the calls and what that's like. Um, if you wanna volunteer, all of those things, um, you're more than welcome to. So please contact me if you're looking to directly partner or even just wanna know more. I'd be happy to schedule 20, 30 minutes to talk more in depth about our programs. Um, so yeah, here is my information and also my boss, Casey Harlows, who is the senior director of 201 and also disaster response for our organization. So again, I will send those in the chat um, and with a minute to go, I will be done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kim. Uh, I know we didn't have as much time, so I appreciate you, um, you know, modifying your, um, maybe just glancing over your um, your presentation. No, you... We do have a few questions, so that's exciting. Okay, yeah, great. Um, so Adriana wants to know, uh, she's heard from 211. Uh, how can an agency connect with you to be in your resources database? Great question, Adri Adriana. Looks like, thank you. Um, we have a email and I will put it in the chat. It's 211 database and you just send your information there and then they will give you a call back to verify some things and you can get into our database. So please, I encourage any and all folks on this call, if you're interested in being in our database, to email this email. Um, and Adriana, if you want to send your email in the chat too, I can make sure to connect you to our data quality team in case anything goes awry. So thank you for that question. It's great. Uh, Sarah also wanted to know if you provided if uh, religious rights or um, church rights or you know from religious purposes are uh, do they count as um, something yeah. you can do with it? That is a great question. You know we don't get too many requests like that, but if that were to be meeting someone's basic needs, we certainly um, could look into that. Um, so yeah, and if there is. If it's one thing we do look at though is long-term sustainability. So if someone needs a ride to church every Sunday, we probably won't provide that. Instead, mm -hmm. we'll look for other resources that can provide that in the long term. Now, if there was an instance where just for one or two Sundays they needed help getting there, that's something that we would help with. But that long term, we look for other resources. Um, our Ride United program is meant to kind of be in the interim and short term, and maybe even in some, uh, you know, last case, worst case scenarios. So. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Like there's a couple of people interested in your database uh, or being added to your database. I know that awesome. Frank Bruno from VM Mobility Services is also reaching out to you or interested okay. in getting in touch Great. with you. Um, I am sending the email now. So everyone that 211 database at unitedwaydenver.org, just send your information there and then our proper, proper people will um, reach out to you. Those that sent your emails, I'll collect those and um, I'll send mine as well. If you don't hear anything back within the, like a week or so, please contact me and we can 
Yeah. And we do upload these videos to YouTube. So when we do that, we'll add that information too, so that people know who was in this meeting and how can they get in touch with, with them. Um, and then I think... Um, Melissa, maybe just have one last question. Oh, yeah. Do we have time um, to answer that quick? Um, so we just help fill out SNAP applications. That's what we are contracted and funded to do. Fun, excuse me, funded to do. However, in certain instances, if it's their first time filling out their SNAP application, we can also help them fill out a Medicaid application because they're so similar, but we don't have access to the same things that like a government agency would. And so we're kind of limited in that. Um, so just for SNAP, however, we have plenty of resources in our database that if they need help with a different application, we can find organizations that do help with that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Yeah, amazing. And thanks for adding your uh, email to um, It seems like a lot of them are very interested, a lot of us here. Great. And with that, and with just one minute after the time, um, we are good to go. Uh, thank you all so much for joining this um, virtual meeting. Our next one is going to be on June 18th. So I look forward to seeing you then. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you, Kim, and thanks to all of our presenters. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you.